So, good evening, everyone. Okay, yes, I got the message. No, it's very late, so let's rush through it, let's get it done, right? Okay, uh, today or tonight we're going to be talking about this, the language of love. So, everybody knows uh, which the language, what language is the language of love? Okay, think about it. And, uh, and let's see uh, what we're going to figure out as we go through, uh, through our presentation. We have to keep in mind a few things. We live in a world of language, so there's no other way to communicate other than language taken in a broader sense. You know, it's not just the spoken words, but also the written words. It also, you know, there's a lot of elements involved in this, like gestures, your face, uh, your uh, intonation, you know, are you speaking loud, you're speaking, also, you know, are you speaking fast, are you speaking too much? You know, that's a problem too. Um, so, there's the whole thing about communication that affects us and everything requires some sort of language. And um, trouble is that, although we know all that, we uh, have not yet mastered how to use language in a very efficient way, uh, in particularly under certain circumstances. That's why we have all these fights, I uh, have all these sometimes frustrations because, you know, our partner cannot understand us, uh, our boss never understands, of course, and so on and so forth. So I hope tonight we are going to bring some light to this issue. Now, as I was putting this together, I found out it's a very long, um, you know, it's a very broad and big theme. So tonight, and hopefully we're going to come back with, you know, the language of love 2-0 in, uh, sometime in the second half. Tonight, the approach we're going to take is, uh, is the following. So my theory is, you know, life is very complicated, life is very complex. But if you know how it works, then you have a better chance of succeeding, right? For example, as a spiritist, right? We know what consolation is. So we know what suffering is all about, what it, what's the meaning of it. So tonight we're gonna, you know, in the first uh, uh, take of this issue, we're gonna, co we're gonna focus more on the basics and more than, you know, into practice of the language of love. All right, some background. Uh, how powerful are our thoughts and words? Right? So, and then we, uh, some of you, if not most of you, um, may have seen the work of this Masaru Emoto. Uh, that's dated 1994. On the impact of words and sounds on water molecules. So what you're seeing here, you may recognize this from last Christmas time, but this is really uh, a molecule of water, of course, magnified, I don't know how many times. And uh, the way they, they, they photograph it is they, they freeze the water and then they photograph the molecules. And that's what you're seeing. It's beautiful. And so how come that's a, you know, a molecule of water? Yes, it is. And, uh, but why is that relevant? Let's see. By the way, there's a document, documentary that's called What the Blip do we know? It's the also maybe 20 years old, but it's really a wonderful documentary that's going to talk about uh, all we're going to see here plus uh, a, a lot more that's very interesting. So, what's the impact of uh, on water of words and sounds? What you're going to see first here is another mo you know picture of another you know of a molecule under uh, the sound of Imagine from John Lennon. And here is a mo another molecule under heavy metal song. So I'm sorry, those that love heavy metal, metal but uh, the, your molecule is going to look like that. Here is uh, a molecule uh, from this Fu Fujiwara Dam, which in uh, the before a prayer, a Buddhist prayer, and then after. See what happens to the molecule of water? Have you, how many of you have seen this uh, documentary before or this subject? Okay. 
You know, it's, it's, it's real. It's science. It's there. Never been contested. Here is a, a water when you say, you disgust me. Right? So if you say that to anybody, so keep that in mind. And again, you fooled me. So, and then the water is going to turn into that, as opposed to something as beautiful as this. Right? So we want all the water to be like that. When we take our fluid, uh, the, uh, the water here, you know, with all the fluids, which one you were taking? I hope, you know, we know we're taking the good ones, right? The beautiful ones. Okay. And how much water there is in our bodies? 50 to 70% of our bodies are, or is water. It depends on your age, depends on if you're fat, skin, or whatever. It, it's going to range between 50 and 70%. And that includes all the others in the tissues, the blood, the bones, and elsewhere in the, in, in the, in the body. And the, the water makes up a significant, significant uh, fraction of the, the human body. So, you can almost make a connection here. So, it's important that if there is such a, if the water is so uh, subject to th those kind of uh, impact when it listens to Beethoven or to uh, a uh, heavy metal song. So what happens to the body inside of, of our? What happens to the water? Or well, 70% of us uh, under one situation or the other. It's so sensitive that this uh, research with the water was also done with uh, just showing pictures to the water. Right? And uh, of course, the, this not being done, never, this, this uh, Japanese guy that did this was not a spiritist or anything like that, so this is really just pure science. So there's a connection here, right, that has not been done or published yet, but I bet uh, you there's a connection between the two, those, those two issues. So, why is that important? Why are these things important? Let's start with this. We have just seen these water crystals reflect the environment. The environment changes the molecule, the shape of the water. It goes from ugly to beautiful or vice versa, we stay in the middle. We also know about the body water that could also be subject to the environment. And then we have had a lot of uh, uh, developments in areas like uh, neuroscience, which now is able through these fancy MIR um, equipments that, that can photograph, uh, understand what's going on in your mind when you are under one situation versus the other. So we have a lot of pictures of the brains under stress, then un, you know, a happy one, and so on and so forth, because that's how it works. Our brain will, sh will, uh, sh be, will sh look like, in a, in a way, depending on the environment. So what's, w what's working, what's around us, when I, call it, when I say environment, our psychosphere, that is important to not our mood and also our body. Uh, epigenetics, another big development <coughs> that says, uh, that took us from believing that our cells would respond to the DNA, so DNA would tell the cells what they should do, and that's gone. It's now proven that what the, our cells will uh, open or close, work or not, based on the environment. But that's the, the scientific world, it's really based on our mind. So whatever you think, um, that determines uh, your environment. Whatever you say, wherever you are. So that's all have an impact on you. Psychologically, well, that's been uh, uh, for a long, long time, a, a lot of studies about relationships, for example. What works in a relationship? Why certain uh, marriages are functional and others are not? And uh, communication, of course, plays a, a, a huge role in that. 
Quantum physics, that's what I'm going to even touch, but it's too much for us. Um, but it's another big development that comes and supports a lot of things that we're going to tell you tonight, which is be aware of who you are, not just spiritually, but how we work. And, and equally important, how our, our partners and friends, um, family work as well. Because you can have a tremendous impact on everybody's days, every day. So the power of thoughts and words, uh, it can heal. You know, words and thoughts can heal or hurt. You may, I'm, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. So you can criticize somebody to death, or you can console somebody. And uh, that's how powerful words are. You can uh, drive the fate of ourselves, as we're talking about, what you say, what you talk. We have an internal voice, right, that keeps talking to us much more than we would like to hear. That thing is the thing that is going to drive us either nuts or happy. It's our own voice talking to us all the time. And uh, if you are mad, so that, own, that voice is causing you to suffer. Your body is suffering. It defines reality in the sense that uh, through words, we, we believe one thing versus the other. So we form these ideas of reality based on what? Language. Everything is language. So, uh, y you know, you can take uh, any case you want, even, you know, with spiritism, right? So we form a concept in our minds based on what? Right? Everything that we read coming from the spirit. It puts us in contact with God. This is how powerful words are and thoughts are in the spiritual world, of course. So we are experts on that. It can define relationships, definitely. It does define the level of relationship. Because if we're not communicating, that means you're not resolving conflicts. Your differences between you two are not being resolved just because you don't know how to resolve conflicts. You have this communication channel, but it use that in a way that instead of uh, resolving conflicts, it might be creating conflicts. It might be uh, a way to actually uh, keep piling up the conflict that you not, have not resolved over the years. And it makes communication effective or ineffective. So uh, I really like and love to see people that speak well, in a way that's concise, in a way that's to the point, in a way that uh, everybody can understand. And when it comes to relationship, so what's the language of love? So let's keep that in mind. All right, brains are wired to respond to thoughts, in and out. So a negative thought will cause a substantial increase in activity in our amygdala and the release of dozens of stress-producing uh, hormones and neurotransmitters. Okay, just a quick stop in there because this is very important. Amygdala here is not to be understood like in Brazil, this gland here, no. Amygdala in English is another thing that's inside, right in the middle of our, uh, our head. And it's, the, it's our alarm system. It's the one that uh, tells you the famous, um, uh, gives you the command to either Fight, flight, or freeze, which is whenever it sees some, uh, a danger of some sort, even if, if that's not the real danger, the, uh, the amygdala will, will get you ready to either flight or fright, or either flight or fight. And uh, you, when you get scared, for example, a lot of things instantly happens to your body, and that's thanks to what? to what they call stress hormones here that's going to take over your body, but immediately we will make uh, you ready to, to run, for example, to be more attentive, to try to find out what's going on, uh, uh, to run if that's the case. So that happened, we are in, you know, all the time, 24 by 7, 365 per year, 
We have all the time a given cocktail of hormones in our body that are responsible for us to be either happy or sad or depressive, right? Uh, and that cocktail of hormone will change according to the environment. So you may be happy, but then I come and make a, a you know, a criticism of you, immediately your cocktail changes. And then all of a sudden your ability, which is in the next point here, your ability to think decreases. Your ability to be compassionate uh, decreases. You lose logic in what you're saying. Um, not 100%, you just lose part of it. But it's enough, for example, for you never know when to stop when you're having a fight. So you want to win all the way to the end. You know, you're going to go through. You, you don't know anymore when to stop. Okay, we have to run today, okay? Negative thoughts and words. When we vocalize then this negativity, let's say you are in a, in a kind of a moody in a given day like today, and, uh, but you're not really holding that to your heart. You're just, you vocalize that. You just need somebody to listen, right? Okay, what do you, are you, you are doing with that? You are creating a situation where you are having this tremendous impact, creating a lot of anxiety and irritability, not only inside of yourself, but also, you know, in, uh, in whoever is uh, you were talking to, right? So, and that creates distrust, um, undermining the ability to build empathy and cooperation. Uh, if we had time here, we would go through some examples, but if you say, I love you, it's diff you know, it, it creates a certain uh, environment, a psychosphere, totally opposed to when you say, I hate you. Right? So, that is the difference. That's the impact of the word the words on how we're going to behave, how we're going to react to situations. Are we going to be, uh, are we going to listen to somebody with compassion, with empathy, with uh, love or whatever? You know, it all depends on that particular uh, psychosphere. So the same thing happens to your brain when you listen to arguments like in the radio. I, there was a time after the election, I guess, that I decided to stop listening to these talk radios like NPR because I just couldn't anymore putting up with all that. It was making me feel, I don't know, nervous, bad. Uh, and uh, I just had to stop for a while. But temptation was too big and I had to come back. I'm still on, but... So lasting effect of negativity. It's very important to know negativity, uh, negative thinking is also self-perpetuating. The more you are exposed to it, your own or others, the more your brain will generate additional negative feelings and thoughts. So it's snowball here. You know, you, when you are negative and you don't get out of that situation, it tends to perpetuate, you know, not forever, but it, it it's, may last too long compared to, where, to how much it should have lasted before it could affect you. Okay? And then you say, well, I'm not in a good mood today. Well, uh, you're going to have to uh, go back in the, at the beginning of the day and see what changed. I was okay when I woke up. The more you engage in negative dialogue at home or at work, the more difficult it is to, be, you know, to stop that, uh, to get involved. In. Angry words send alarm messages throughout the brain and, and they partially shut down the logic and reasoning centers. Our brain is complicated, it's complex, it's really something that science has not mastered yet, we all know that. But the little they have already tell us a lot. So we have several regions, several functions in our brains. For example, language is controlled in a given part of our brains here in the front lobe. And um, like I was talking about the middle, that is uh, your alarm. Uh, and it's, it's of, of course, works perfectly, but under what? Under the command of our mind. So, this study is not about the mind, but the, by looking at the way, by looking at the way the brains work, then you can have a, uh, you can trace it back to how you think, <laughs> what you do to make this side of the, the you know, your brains to work as opposed to this side, and so on. We kind of touched on that. Words shape our reality. Thoughts and words can change the way we feel. 
uh, through repetitive focusing on positive images, feelings. Okay, this, this is a different aspect here. Uh, it's interesting, you can try it yourself uh, on the way back home. If you keep thinking about positive things, uh, you know, in the, for example, little successes uh, over your, your, for example, professional life, right? Then all of a sudden, before you know it, you are like manic, you are enjoying that, you are happy, you are feeling, you know, fulfilled, you're feeling good just by thinking about your successes uh, over the last 10 years or whenever, whatever you want. Or last week's, you know, great deal that you closed, whatever, whatever made you happy, you bring that back and all of a sudden you're going to be in good mood. That's how it works. Now, positive but irrational beliefs also is a problem. It makes you feel happy, but they are irrational. So when doctors and therapists teach pa patients uh, to reframe negative thoughts and worries into positive affirmations, the communication process improves that the patient and the patient regains self-control and confidence. You know, nobody can come into my office. Well, of course they can, but it's my job that everybody comes to my office and leave my office with a little bit more hope, okay? They're gonna live with more hope. Just like here, we come over here and we live with more of a number of things, but more hope, like a consolation, for example. All my suffering is not for nothing. And I thought I was the last man on, on earth. So, bump you up. Okay, also stimulate anxiety in, in positive words can lower it. Our inner language. Brain scan researchers uh, show that uh, concentrating and meditating on positive thoughts, feelings, and outcomes can be more powerful than any drug in the world. And this is science, this is nothing here that's myself. Especially when it comes to changing old habits, behaviors, and beliefs. So, for example, somebody suffering from anxiety or depression or something like that, not some clinical stuff, but you know, not something pathological, very bad. But they may need the uh, you know, medicine to go over or go through the crisis and help him uh, be more prepared for therapy, but at the end of the day, uh, the, he's going to stop with the, uh, or let's put it this way, medicine is not going to cure him. It's going to stabilize him. And then he's going to work on himself and then go back to the world better. And, uh, and it's not, was not the, the, the drug, it was himself that changed it. Okay, so this entire process is driven by the language-based processes of the brain. So we have a language-based process in our brain. By changing the way you s use language, you change your consciousness. Here's another important wo uh, word. And that, in turn, influences every thought, feeling. Okay, going back to my example here, as you work on yourself, you change, re you transform reality as the way you used to see it, in principally or particularly in regarding to yourself, right? And then, what does that do? Um, it cures you. But you've, you, what's going to happen, you're going to become conscious of the true reality, your reality, not that reality that was created either by you or for you. Okay. By changing your inner language, you're, you can transform the reality, of course, which uh, you live in. Okay. Look, we're saying, well, what does that have to do with uh, the love of language? Let me just break for a minute here. Again, if you understand how communication impacts you and your neighbor, okay, then you're going to be speaking in a way that's going to generate what? If you're not love, you're going to generate uh, peace, for example, right? It's going to generate encouragement, it's going to generate uh, even love, it's going to generate uh, motivation for, for the person to keep going on and face the, the challenges. 
elements of communication that matters? How do? Let's talk a little bit about this. So what makes human communication unique? It's not just the uh, quality of our speech, but the, and, and not the quantity. Okay, we're gonna have to come back to the quantity issue. We use tens of thousands of facial expressions, body movements, and words, and we can combine them in endless combinations that allow us to express different nu nuances of meaning and emotion. And what happens? Even a simple alteration, alteration of the rate and rhythm of our speech can change the context of what we say and the way it will be processed in the listener's brain. Okay, so now you're saying communication then is not just the words, you know, choosing the right words, that's definitely important. But it depends on your shouting, it depends on you are speaking too low, or you're speaking too slowly, or you're speaking too fast. And what kind of face you are making when you were saying, oh, you look beautiful today, but with that face, you know, and then that's not going to work either, right? So sarcasm, for example, doesn't work. It's, you know, it could be beautiful words spoken with sarcasm and contempt, and it's going to work the other way, you know, you, you know, compared to what you would expect, what you want. So we have to pay attention to our, uh, when it comes to communication, there's a, everything is important from the, the speed you speak at, the face you're going to make, uh, the tone of your voice, everything is important. Bec and part of it is because, I guess, it's going to come here at some point. We assume the other person is listening to the words the way we would do. But no, they have a different uh, framework in their mind. They have a different background. They have a different, perhaps, uh, uh, level of uh, religiosity. He may not, he may not uh, believe in God, for example. And if, you, the other person is the other person. And whatever you say, uh, and you don't say it in a way that the other person can understand what you're trying to mean, then it's lost communication. So don't be deaf, uh, deaf uh, when you speak. Body language plays an essential part in conveying a message in a meaningful way. So the tone of your voice, you know, the pitch, loudness, tempo, and rhythm will often convey more useful information than the words you say. So again, you know, if you're, some people like me here, you know, keep talking, 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 and I don't do like some people do, right? Well, uh, and of course, I remember when uh, at the beginning of his career, Umberto Fabri came over, came to Bezerra to give us a course on, on how to communicate, all right? So I'm, I'm failing, okay, regarding that. But, you know, Trump was very good. Huge, right? So we all understand that. And uh, so the way you communicate includes what you were talking about, comprehensive, right? A way. But we don't need to do that at home. All we need to do is to use the language in the best way possible with the right tone according to the person you know. You have to know who is in the other side. What are, you know, his or her needs? That's very important. If you don't use the right tone of voice, you may convey the wrong meaning, okay? Let's uh, pay close attention to, you know, everything in communication, words, tone, facial expression, gestures. The language of consciousness. Uh, normally when we speak, we make the, uh, the assumption that the, you know, the other person will understand exactly what you're trying to say. Well, no. Actually, there's a fantastic book Cells still today, like, like we say in Brazil, like water. Uh, it's called The Four Agreements. And really, it's four pieces there. And that's going to teach, teach us how to, uh, to be ourselves at the same time, how to communicate. But one of them, uh, agreement number three, was, uh, is about do not assume anything, don't make assumptions, because we assume that I know what you're thinking, that you understand my problem, I know exactly what you're thinking, but I don't. 
And that's part of the communication problem because we always say, oh, uh, I know where you're coming from. I know what you're going to say. And of course, uh, to, to gain time, we cut the person off and say, oh, here's what you're going to say. I don't know. I guess it doesn't happen here, right? Okay. okay. We can also improve our communication skills by taking advantage of another neuroscientific fact. The slower you speak, the more the listener's comprehension will increase. Speaking slowly, not too slow, because then, you know, people will sleep, but speaking slowly also relaxes both the speakers and listeners. You try it yourself. When you talk to somebody that's speaking too fast and make all these gestures, you get tired of listening to the person, right? Then you get lost. And she speaks too long. Wow, that's too much. So, again, keep imagining, you know, how you do in a day-to-day, -day, you, you know, with your partner and family. Brevity reduces conflict. This is uh, probably something you have not heard before. Sometimes even 30 seconds is too long, especially in situations where emotions run high. What we do normally when we get mad at somebody, we are a little, we just say we are a little nervous or something like that, and then we want to explain and we go on this thorough explanation why you're right, thinking that that's the best thing to do, and that's wrong. A lot of, um, in this research here, for example, a lot of uh, uh, case, you know, groups they had formed, and the shorter the time they would uh, argue with each other, the better and faster the outcome. And uh, so it's a mistake to assume that the more I talk, the more you will understand me, M the more clear my points are going to be. So it's interesting when we read this uh, research because they put these people that could not resolve their conflicts, and they came to a point where they were limited to one sentence. So they had to put in that one sentence, okay, the real meaning of what they wanted to say at that point in time of the argument. Right? And it went back and forth, as opposed to those uh, long conversations where we, you know, one keeps cutting the other off. And, you know, when you are losing, you bring, you know, all the other issues from 10 years ago to help you in that particular situation. And then another conflict that's not going to be resolved. Human cooperation. Okay, so communication boils down to, uh, to this. You know, it involves the accurate transference transference of uh, information from my brain to the other. So when I'm talking here, I'm trying to transfer what, I'm, what I have in my mind to your mind. Okay, so how does that happen? Is that possible? So when we do this through the process called neural resonance, and the more we can mirror the neural activity of the other person's brain, the better we are able to cooperate with them. Uh, to gain some time here, you know, if I'm talking to you and looking to me, trying to follow me without judging me, you're just paying attention to the meaning of what I'm saying, then the chances, chances are that you're going to understand me. This is the neural resonance. So you kind of are putting my, yourself in my shoes for just long enough while I'm talking to you and then chances are you're going to understand me. But what we do when we don't want to talk about something and we're not interested in that, particularly if that's a contentious issue or something like that, you know, you say, oh, keep talking that I'm, uh, yeah, I'm working on this here, but keep talking, talking, I'm listening to you. That happens a lot. So instead of doing that, look into the eyes of the person and engage in the conversation, then chances are you're going to understand. With, you know, in more than that, we're going to do it in a way that's compassionate, which is comp compassionate communication. To achieve optimal co cooperation, it also helps uh, to have belief systems that are similar. We're going to just kill this one here, but of course, if I don't believe in the same thing you do, then our conversation is going to be complicated. It, it requires us to work on that a little bit to find some common ground before we can make a resolution on anything. 
social rules. Thus, you know, anger never works. What happens when people don't cooperate and how, uh, and how does the, the brain respond when somebody treats us unfairly or takes advantage of our generosity? Well, our brain is wired to react to what they call altruistic punishment. We want to punish whoever in one way or the other. It's altruistic because, you know, it's the way uh, fine people will react, right? It's not like a punch in the guy, you know? That's why it's altruistic. You're going to diplomatically or something like that uh, respond to the situation. Huh? And um, it doesn't work. So there's no place for anger in, like we say here, in personal relationships, punishment, whether in the form of anger, criticism, or judgment, rarely works. So punishing is not the way to resolve conflicts. That's proven. So if you want to come to a consensus or an agreement uh, on whatever, you cannot say um, until you do it, you're not going to have your cell phone, for example, like we do with kids, right? Uh, it's, it, punishment is not the way to resolve. Does power work? According to the United Nations, cooperation, not power, is the key to conflict resolution. When one party tries to impose its belief systems and values on another, conflicts escalate. So just because I have the power does not mean we're going to have a wonderful conversation. I may listen to you, but we may not, never get anywhere. So what about um, Emmanuel? What do, do, do the spirits tell us? So here's actually, uh, there's a number of books that talk about uh, words and communication. It's hard to pick uh, the best one, but here's a good one. What comes out of your, this is coming from Jesus, there's a, kind of the background for this page of this book. Uh, what comes out of the mouth originates in the heart, and it, this contaminates man. So let's see uh, wh what that means. The psychic elements externalize it by us through our mouth, our potent influence acting on our behalf. So I'm speaking to you, and of course using my mouth, and uh, what I'm telling you is coming from inside me. And of course, it's reflecting my emotions, my background, what I think, what I want to accomplish. What, you know, I, do I want to get you mad? Do I want to get you in love? Do I want to get you in peace? Right? Um, they are active factors working under our responsibility, both around us and even at a distance, according to our most secret intentions. Our intentions is a leading factor. If you have the intention to hurt, you will. So, oh, I do not mean to hurt you. Oh, okay. Hmm. Okay. You know, you do not mean to hurt me, huh? Okay. But be, be more careful maybe next time. It is imperative to watch our mouth because the verb, you know, the, 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 the words creates insinuates, inclines, modifies, renew, or destroy through the live expression of our personality. So that's in, the, in this book from Emmanuel, the Vigne de Luz. So in this very last one here summarizes very well so what words can do. It's not even complete, but you know, the way we use it. And uh, putting that with the previous one, with our secret intentions, that makes all the difference. Emmanuel, now in another, another book, it's Fonte Viva, he says, through language, a man can help himself or harm himself. Right? Remember, I can, I can hit you with bad words, but I may be the one that's, that's the loser here. Right? Because I turned you uh, against me, for example, or I have not accomplished what I need to accomplish. You're no longer my friend. If you're my wife, I may, you may put me in the, uh, ne you know, next door, f to, to sleep next door for a while. Even when we are full of problems, it's not desirable that our words to others be harsh. <laughs> it's scientific that when, uh, uh, in 94% of the cases, 
when we start a conversation with harsh words, normally with a criticism, starting with you, that conversation, there's the 94% chance that it's going to be a bad conversation, we will not lead to anywhere. So on, on our next presentation about the same subject, we're going to have uh, some good practical ways uh, of really speaking the language of love. Each of us have our own challenges, needs, and pain, and it is not fair to increase others' affliction with the burden of our concerns. So, perhaps the best example is a boss that uh, uh, his wife got him in the morning and he gets to the office, and then all of a sudden, the office goes uh, dark. You know? That the psychosphere is gone. Words are the channel of our self. Let's not forget it. Okay? People, for example, that use bad words, why do they do that? They don't know the language? Or they're doing that because machismo, for example, or because he wants to hurt. Because every bad word turns the uh, our ability to comprehend a little down. Through words, our passion explodes or our virtues expand. So, five, four minutes late. Thank you very much and have a great weekend. Yeah.